Hi, welcome to Nightmare Masterclass. My name's Dave, I'm your host. Uh, you know me. So uh, I've been working on this pet scop video, trying to figure out what's going on exactly. And well, today we're having a tea party with Paul. See, there's Paul. Hi, Paul. Paul can't open doors, so I assume I'm gonna have to help him sip his tea. Okay, there we go. Okay, then there's Marvin. Hi, Marvin. I am fairly sure that Marvin is a murderer, but let's not get into that right now. Um, and then we have Triangle Face. I don't know what this triangle is supposed to mean, but probably has something to do with the Pythagorean theorem or something like that. Um, I don't really know at this point. Uh, so how do you take your T, Triangle Face? Hello and welcome to Nightmare Masterclass. My name is David Stockdale. I'll be your host on this excursion into the dark unknown. This is the fifth part of my analysis on the enigmatic web series Petscop. And while the opening of this video might have been a bit of an exaggeration, you know, I haven't lost my grip on sanity quite yet, but this series has definitely left me scratching my head on many occasions. The 11th video came out last Christmas after months of radio silence from the channel. The 12th video came out not too long after that. And in March of this year, the 13th video was released. It's safe to say that there's plenty of new material to cover here, and I'm fairly confident in saying that my analysis will cover some new and compelling ground. As always, if you spot a mistake or just think my interpretation is wildly off base, feel free to discuss in the comments. Just a bit of housekeeping at the top of the hour here. A few people have asked me why I don't have a Patreon account. The reason is I don't think I'm currently in a position where Patreon will be a useful tool for me. I think I need a larger subscriber count for Patreon to really be worth the effort. Maybe somewhere down the line it will happen, but for the time being, there are a few other ways to help me out. If you enjoy my videos and have a few bucks to spare, I want you to please consider supporting me on ko-fi.com forward slash nightmare masterclass. Please know that your donations are highly appreciated. Your support enables me to continue doing what I do. But if you are at a point in your life where you think you can't make the expenditure, that is totally fine as well. There are other ways to support me. First and foremost, you can share my videos with anyone you think might be interested. And of course, you can like and subscribe to my channel. Be sure to turn notifications on so you'll be alerted when I upload a new video. And this is tangentially related, but I also want to announce that I'm starting up an Etsy shop with the aim of selling inspirational prints. Here is my first product. It's an 8x12 print of a quote by Schopenhauer. After your death, you will be what you were before your birth. It's a great reminder to have around the house. So if you're looking for some exquisite decor, check it out. I'll have a link in the video description. All right, so let's talk about Petscop. I must say that I've been a bit reticent to put out another video on Petscop because I do want to encourage viewers to watch the videos and come up with their own conclusions about this nightmarish internet puzzle. My goal here at Nightmare Masterclass is always to encourage critical thinking and, well, if I succumb to the massive pressure from my audience to put out a video as soon as possible after this new material came out, I feel like I wouldn't be giving you all enough time to really think about it for yourselves. And to be totally honest, I've needed some time to digest the material myself, but now, Having gone over these three new videos with a fine-tooth comb, I am fairly confident in saying my approach towards this series is proving to bear fruit, as it were. Or at least, I think so, anyway. In this installment, I'll be covering videos 11 through 13. When you hear this noise, along with the word footnote, it means I'm taking a brief pause to note something peculiar. 
and be sure to stick around because I'll be doing a comprehensive analysis of this new material towards the end of the video. Before I get started, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Petscop subreddit and those who have contributed to the so-called comprehensive progress document. Their various findings and speculations have apprised this analysis in numerous ways. Seriously, if you are interested in looking into this for yourself, check out the progress document. It contains far more information than I could possibly hope to relay in one of my videos. I'll have a link in the video description. Now, as always, I strongly encourage you to watch the series for yourself before watching my videos on the topic. You're really doing yourself a disservice if you choose not to do so. And if you haven't seen my previous videos in the investigation series, I'd suggest starting with part one. But you know, I'm gonna go ahead and assume that most of my audience watched those videos quite some time ago. So here's a little refresher. Paul, our protagonist, is a young man who has happened upon an old PlayStation game by the name of Petscop. Increasingly, it seems as though the game is getting rather um, cryptic. Moreover, it seems as though there have been some shenanigans happening with the Petscop YouTube channel. Paul seems to have lost control of the channel, and a mysterious group who we'll refer to as the Proprietors has taken ownership. More on that in a minute. Now, occasionally Paul comes across notes in the game signed by someone named Rainer. I suspect that this Rainer referenced in the game is, in actuality, the person who designed Petscop. I stated in my previous installment that I think Rainer is either a witness or perhaps even complicit in certain heinous crimes, crimes that are vaguely alluded to in the game itself. I've speculated that perhaps the purpose of the game Petscop is indeed to expose these crimes or at least document them to a select audience. I believe these crimes were either committed or facilitated by the group of people who maintain the YouTube channel. Again, people I've previously referred to as the proprietors. Keep in mind that I'm referring to the fictional universe of Petscop here. Prior to the 11th video's publication, the channel icon was changed back to an image of Paul's avatar, leading many to believe new material was imminent. That proved to be correct. Petscop 11 dropped on Christmas Day, December 25th, 2017. And what a gift it was. At 29 minutes and 31 seconds, it is the longest video to date. The channel description was updated around that time as well. It currently reads as follows. Everything we wish to say is below. The purpose of this YouTube channel is to preserve and display the recordings within the video game Petscop while keeping some of their content private. They were first given to us as a Christmas gift many years ago. The game had an interesting journey before and after that day. Paul created some additional recordings in 2017 as a way to show Petscop gameplay to his friend. He created this account in order to upload those additional recordings in video format. He later passed ownership of the channel to us, but continued to record himself at our strong suggestion. Though he had issues with the arrangement, these have finally been settled. Please enjoy the recordings in Petska. We do. And then there's that signature smiley face at the end there. This text is also displayed in the description of each of the new videos. The main thing I should note here is the weird tension between Paul and the proprietors. Primarily, let's focus on the transition of the channel's ownership from Paul to the proprietors. The channel update states that Paul, quote, passed ownership of the channel to us, end quote. And this is a fairly innocuous framing of the situation. However, um, I don't know about you, but I'm getting some malevolent vibes from the proprietors. It is worth asking if this was a willful decision made on Paul's part, or if it was a choice made under some amount of duress. It's entirely possible that the proprietors coerced Paul into transferring ownership of the channel either through direct threats to his safety or possibly through blackmail. We should also ask when exactly this transition took place. It's not entirely clear, but there are a few possible indications. For instance, the fifth video, uploaded on April 11, 2017, has a peculiar video description. It begins with the following statement. Hello folks, I guess this is for all of you now. It raises the question, what changed between video four and video five? Could this be when the transition of ownership took place? The proprietors state that Paul, quote, had issues with the arrangement, referring to the dynamic by which Paul records his Petscop experiences and sends them to the proprietors, after which they publish select content. 
And when you think about it, it's entirely understandable why Paul would have issues with such an arrangement. After all, it seems to me that the proprietors have all the power here. They determine what gets uploaded. At this point, I'm also operating under the assumption that it is the proprietors who are carrying out the censorship that we see in the game. I stated as much in my fourth investigation video. The proprietors state that Paul made additional recordings in 2017. This is a peculiar way to put it. Are there previous recordings that we haven't seen? In fairness, we really have no idea how long Paul has been playing this game. And as we'll see a bit later on in the video, there's something weird going on with Paul. He could very well be having lapses in his memory. Let's work through these three new videos with an understanding that this new channel description does not seem to bode well for Paul. Let's get started with the 11th video. At the very beginning of this video, Paul says something interesting. There were signs along the way um, that I ignored. Because it would have been a completely ridiculous idea to me. Um, but when I found my room, it made... Uh, well, I was shocked at first, but it made sense. Especially considering where I found the game in the first place. Footnote. Here, Paul alludes to finding his own room in the game. Now, this is speculation, but I would venture to guess that the room he's referring to here is the one that contained the censored item in video 7. This would be consistent with my theory that the item censored in this room pertains to something personal to Paul himself. It could be an item which perhaps gives away his identity. Back to the video. Paul explains that he assumed the game would be connected in some way to the person he's speaking to, the very same person he's apparently been speaking to throughout these videos, the person it would seem he's made these videos for. Footnote. We still don't quite know this mystery person's identity, but in this video, Paul wonders aloud to himself about the last time he's seen them. Tellingly, he says, when's the last time I saw any of you at all? So, it could be that Paul is talking about someone from a group of estranged family members. This is highly speculative, but the way Paul is describing things, it almost sounds as though he could be referring to a cousin, perhaps. Someone he saw on a semi-regular basis on holidays like, say... Just for instance, Christmas. So Paul would have seen this person a few times a year, at least until that is, something happened that caused Paul's immediate family to have a falling out with his estranged relatives. Back to the video. Paul estimates that the last time he had seen these people was around 1999. He was a small child at the time. Paul seems to be attempting to perform some kind of elaborate series of movements in the Newmaker plane. He explains that he's made a drawing. He says that the visual will help the person he's communicating with to understand the explanation. Paul's fairly confident that this series of movements will work, although it's not entirely clear yet what this is supposed to accomplish. Suddenly, a prompt comes up. It's similar to the ones that come up when Paul is interfacing with the tool. Strangely, Paul seems to know exactly what to do at this point in order to progress further. All right, so the way this works, I'm supposed to pass on this one. The prompt disappears and we see a big wheel in the middle of the field. Paul circles around it in an elaborate sort of way and the prompt reappears. He asks, where is house? The wheel begins spinning and Paul assumes that it is pointing in the direction he's supposed to go. Footnote. How does Paul know what to do here exactly? Well, keep in mind that we could very well be missing footage. It's entirely possible that this whole series of movements was demonstrated to him in some way. Perhaps, maybe through a demo sequence. Back to the video. Paul goes in the direction indicated, and he comes across a road. It's not quite what he expected, but he follows the road to the left and finds a sign. The sign reads, This is a frozen house captured three times exactly as it was. Paul explores the area and finds a house. This seems to be the house first seen on a picture in the second video. Paul goes up to the door and uses his green key. 
prompt reads, the key still works. It still works. Though you've unlocked the door, you can't open it. Recall that Paul's character can't open doors. Paul acknowledges that this is a reoccurring joke in the game. The video cuts to another point in time. Paul muses about a game mechanic that perplexes him. On the road, he's required to turn his joystick clockwise to go to the left and counterclockwise to go to the right. He compares it to the saying, righty tighty, lefty loosey. Usually made in reference to tightening or loosening a screw when putting something together. He admits that this has always thrown him off and he has to consciously think about it in order to perform the required task. The door opens and Paul enters the house. Footnote. What made the door open? It's not entirely clear, but I think this in-game reference to our protagonist not being able to open doors, I think this might actually be a reference to Paul himself, a sort of inside joke amongst Paul's extended family. This could possibly relate to the coordination issue Paul admits to having with the whole righty-tighty, lefty-loosey thing. Back to the video. Paul explores the area, collecting gifts as he moves forward. Various figures appear, disappear, and reappear as he goes through the house. Footnote. These figures resemble people, but they're not animated in the same fashion as Paul. They're more akin to the figures that appear in the various bedrooms, the child figures that sit on the various beds generated from the child library system. A prompt displays lines of dialogue. The text is a purple color. It reads as follows. Where have you been? Why were you gone for such a long time? Now, listen to this. There's an audible murmur shortly after this line. As best I can gather, this soundbite is indiscernible, but I think it is possibly intended to mimic the ambient noises of the house, a television left running, perhaps. Another prompt appears. Is this a present? Who is it for? Paul examines the calendars on the wall next to the Christmas tree. Footnote, let's take a closer look at these calendars ourselves, shall we? Now, Paul correctly observes that these two calendars are for different years. Let's start with the calendar to the left. This one would appear to indicate the year 1997. Every day after Christmas is a darker shade than the rest of the month. There's a Christmas tree icon on Christmas Day. It's swaying back and forth. The first 10 days of November are shaded in green. Every day in June is highlighted except for the second through the fourth. July, August, September, and October are shaded entirely in green. Weekends in March, April, and May are shaded in green as well. Weekends in February are highlighted except for Saturday the 1st and Sunday the 9th. Tuesday the 4th, Thursday the 6th, and Monday the 10th are also highlighted in green. Even days in January are highlighted. Note also that the 13th of June has a number of symbols that would appear to correspond to buttons on a PlayStation controller. But alas, it's difficult to say. Take a look for yourself. I've turned up the contrast a bit. Now let's look at the calendar to the right. This one would appear to indicate the year 2000. Unlike the previous instance, none of the contents are highlighted in green. Though as with the previous calendar, every day after Christmas is darkened. If you recall, a previous channel update stated as follows. Rainer gave this gift to us on Christmas 1997 and 2000. It was the single longest day of our lives. We were all certain he was dead at the time. He had been missing since June 1997 and 2000. We're not as concerned about these things now. So it would appear that there's a correlation here. Now let's just take note of an oddity. Paul has collected a total of 365 pieces prior to looking at the calendar. Is this meant to represent one piece for each day of the year? Back to the video. Paul alludes to a conversation about a girl who went missing on June 5th and was found on November 10th. He has trouble remembering this event and suspects that he wasn't visiting so much when it occurred. This girl who purportedly went missing also happens to be the same age as Paul. She bears a striking resemblance to him if we're to believe Paul's account. We can possibly infer that care is a representation of this girl. Another prompt appears. The text is displayed in white. It says, can I use the bathroom? Someone responds, of course. Like before, this text is in purple. Things get a little weird from here on out. Paul wanders into the bathroom, but not before a trippy little interlude in which a jingle plays. 
camera zooms in on the television towards the front of the house. The game jumps back to Paul in the bathroom. Take note that there is a white block above the bathtub. The symbol on this block is identical to the symbol that scrolls across the screen in Randis and Wavy's room back in Even Care. Suddenly, it appears as though the game has restarted. The title screen appears, and then we get a shot of the tunnel seen in previous videos. The demo sign is flashing, indicating that Paul is perhaps not controlling the game at this point, though that's actually not entirely clear. The game takes us through a tunnel and down a path. A clock appears. It's set at 3 o'clock, but it's not clear whether that's AM or PM. The viewer approaches a large gray structure. As we go through the door, the screen cuts to Paul's avatar in a field, along with the figure we've come to recognize as Marvin. The demo sign now flashes at the bottom of the screen. Again, it's not clear what this is meant to indicate. The player walks up to Marvin, who is standing in front of a park bench. Recall that we've previously seen a park bench depicted in the room with the large cake. There's a flashing controller cord at the top of the screen, along with the text P2 to talk. This would seem to indicate that the player must use the controller to converse with Marvin. A pattern of PlayStation controller buttons appears above Marvin's head, and the word hello appears shortly thereafter. Another pattern appears with the word Paul, with two L's instead of a U, forming the sentence, hello Paul. The game apparently has a system in which certain patterns of buttons create words. Paul's avatar struggles, but he is eventually able to get out a greeting. Hello, he says. Marvin responds, funny, ha ha. After this, Paul's avatar follows Marvin into what would appear to be the school, first seen in the second video. A more detailed and somewhat grotesque looking version of Marvin's face appears during the loading screen. Take a look for yourself. Inside the school, we are given more of a second person perspective with Paul's avatar facing away from us. There's a brick frame around the display. A small green tool-shaped object is displayed to the right of Paul's avatar. Paul walks through the school and the game glitches as he moves to the right. The floor comes through the brick frame. Paul collects pieces, but they don't actually disappear as he picks them up. It would appear that this is a very hastily designed level. There's an abrupt cut to black. It's not clear whether the level has restarted or there's been a post-gameplay edit. Again, the floor passes through the brick frame as the player traverses the school. This time, the screen darkens and it appears as though the player has control over the green tool. It moves across the screen. Eventually, it becomes clear that this is a particular mode of gameplay. The player continues onward and comes across a locker with a combination lock attached. The player attempts to manipulate the lock and a sound plays indicating that it cannot be opened so easily. The combination lock appears larger on the screen and the player messes around with it. The tool begins moving and starts manipulating the lock. The screen cuts back to Paul at the house. The very same jingle plays as the camera zooms in on the television again. Paul enters the bathroom but this time the white block is suspiciously absent along with the ramp leading up to the tub. Paul says, that was an experience. Footnote. It's unclear what has just transpired, but there's something strange going on here. Paul notices that the white block is missing, but he sounds a bit disoriented. Has Paul lost time, perhaps? Has the game been edited in a tricky sort of way? How much time has passed since the last time Paul was in this bathroom? It could be that Paul is experiencing disassociative amnesia, which just so happens to be a symptom of people coping with PTSD. Has Paul experienced some trauma in his life? We can't say for sure, but based on the ominous subtext of this game, it's not out of the question to speculate along these lines. If this is the case, it's worth considering the possibility that something in the game is triggering Paul's disassociative state, something that reminds him of a traumatic experience. Back to the video. Paul goes back into the main part of the house and the Christmas tree is missing. There are a few other noticeable differences as well. There's a bucket in the middle of the room. Paul's able to move it around. Note also that there's only one calendar on the wall. There's also no figures appearing and disappearing in this scene, unlike before. 
Paul walks up to the cork board with a couple of notes attached to it. The first note reads as follows. My husband may come here after 6 p.m. Please stay overnight if you can. Thank you so, so, so much. And then there's a large black dot with a hole in the middle similar to the one we saw during the trippy interlude in video 6. Paul checks out the calendar again, and this time June is the first month to come up. Again, it would appear that this calendar is from 1997. The first is highlighted in green, and every day after the fifth is darkened. Additionally, the number five is animated, seemingly as though to mark the fifth as a significant day. Footnote. Keep in mind what the sign in the front of the house says. This is a frozen house captured three times exactly as it was. Based on this statement, we can possibly infer that the different states of the house represent different time periods. This instance would appear to indicate the year 1997 since only one calendar is present. Paul examines some items in the bottom left corner of the room, but it's not clear what these things are. There appear to be a set of interlocking green chains. They're vibrating rapidly. Paul enters a bedroom. To his surprise, Care is sitting at the foot of the bed. She's surrounded by a transparent box, which prevents Paul from getting close to her. An AC unit blocks the window above her. Note that the clock on the wall indicates that the time is 6.10. Footnote. Recall the note in the front room. It said, my husband may come here after 6 p.m. The note implores the reader to stay at the house. This is most plausibly read as a plea for help. In this portion of the game, Care has some kind of force field surrounding her. It stands to reason that this represents an order of protection. Of course, if there are no police officers around to, you know, enforce the order of protection, it doesn't do much good. It's essentially symbolic, hence the visual representation of a force field here. Back to the game. Every so often, Care turns blue and begins shaking for a brief moment. Paul expresses confusion. At around the 19 minute mark, the game cuts and it appears as though some time has passed. If we are to believe the clock, it's been a few minutes. Paul exits the house and there's an enigmatic loading screen. Footnote. I've messed with this image a bit, and as you can see, it appears to be a room with a chair in it. There's not much else discernible here, as far as I can gather. Paul walks around the house to see if there's anything else to be done. He then goes back into the house to see if there's anything he's missed. Again, he explores the bedroom. This time, it's approaching 6.15. Paul enters the small room to the left, presumably a closet, and the door closes behind him. And remember, Paul can't open doors. Paul waits around. Suddenly, the AC unit crashes to the floor and Marvin appears. He obtains care and abruptly leaves. A prompt reads, care has left the room. Footnote. Recall that in video six, Marvin asks, where is my house? Did Paul lead Marvin to his house? The door opens and the room reverts back to its former state with care still sitting on the foot of the bed. Paul goes back into the main room and briefly sees Marvin again. Paul attempts to look for Marvin. Then he goes outside and sees a ladder leading up to Care's bedroom. He climbs the ladder, enters a room, and catches her, just as Marvin previously did. Paul goes to the start menu. There's a message. I'll come out in a minute. Keep playing. Paul reads Care A's description. When the emergency began, you were all looking for Care A. I told you all, we would never find Care A. When Care A goes missing, she goes missing forever. My brother didn't want us to find him because he knew we were all looking for Michael A. I'm back. This is my present for you. I started it in 1996 for Marvin. If you think they're worth any effort, see if you can save Care B or Care NLM. Care B is in the school, of course. Fuck you all and fuck me as well. Merry Christmas. Check your bathroom now. Rainer. Paul remarks, I saw him at a birthday party once. Paul explains that he was in the basement playing video games. He was older than the rest of the kids at the party. Paul checks the bathroom but finds nothing. The screen cuts and we're back in the school. The demo sign flashes across the top of the screen. There's a short loading screen. It depicts a piano with a PlayStation controller attached to the top of it. The keys appear to have been stripped off. The player enters a classroom. Marvin stands near a teacher's desk. 
play music for baby, he says. She will become Melody. A pyramid-shaped object appears. The player picks it up. Thanks, the player says. The player begins manipulating the object and playing a series of notes. Lovely, Marvin says. He approves. Suddenly, the music becomes erratic and off-key. Footnote. The root note appears on the chalkboard as a home icon. When the player goes off-key, we no longer see the root note depicted on the board. Marvin says she tripped and fell and is lost. The player continues to play out of key. Stop, Marvin says. Sorry, says the player. Marvin says, Tiara plays bad music too. Do it right next time. The player says, sad. Marvin responds, okay, Paul. And that's the end of video 11. The 12th video was uploaded on January 4th, 2018. It begins with a demo sequence in which the player explores Quitter's room. After a short time, a figure appears. It's an exact copy of Paul's avatar, except there's a large red triangle shape over the face. As with previous instances in Quitter's Room, this figure mirrors the player's actions. The player exits Quitter's Room and begins to collect pieces as they explore the area. Strangely, the figure with the red triangle over its face follows the player outside and appears to merge with them. Take a look for yourself. Note also that the piece count begins at zero. We can possibly infer from this that we are witnessing one of the player's first experiences with this game, or perhaps the start of a new session. A prompt comes up. Hi, Belle. You're free. I left these messages for you to look at in case you were ever rescued. So while you walk around looking for something to do, I'll come up periodically. When the messages run out, I'll be out of your hair forever and ever. The player walks around a narrow pathway and the video cuts to another point in time. The player is viewing Michael Hammond's grave. Another prompt appears. You've apparently been running Petscop nonstop for 553,758,221 seconds or 153,822 hours. That looks dubious to me. What do you think? The player continues to explore the area. Footnote. 153,822 hours is approximately 17 and a half years. This would appear to indicate that the game was started sometime in the middle of the year 2000, assuming that the time of the video's release at least somewhat adheres to the time of its recording. Back to the video. Are you still sitting on a chair? Can you still look around the room? Is there still a room? This is the child library. You're not family, so I didn't add your traits to the face system. That means I didn't add your eyes, your eyebrows, or your nose. The player goes to the new maker plane and sees Marvin standing in a field. A prompt reads, don't get lost. Marvin begins moving in an elaborate fashion. The player continues exploring the area. Again, the scene cuts and it appears as though some time has passed. Happy birthday, Belle. I'm calling you Belle because that's who you are. You might be confused as to what happened. I was over eager before and started calling you Tiara prematurely. I created a space in the menu for you, still unused now. Then I put you inside the machine and started playing Straczynski's septet on the needles. I played it wrong, but that would have been okay. If you hadn't given up halfway, you would be Tiara. This is not what happened, and now I'm gone. After this, the player stands around for a while. They open the start menu, and the video abruptly ends. Though, if you freeze the frame here, you'll notice something interesting. There's no longer an option to quit the game. The 13th video was published on March 11th, 2018 the one-year anniversary of the channel's creation. The video begins with what appears to be a demo sequence, though strangely enough, Paul speaks as though he's playing the game. Looks like we finally made some progress. 
Paul moves the bucket from the house to the road. There's a blue tool shaped object to the left. It moves along with Paul as he pushes the bucket. Paul passes through a large arc and the object rises up. Paul figures out that the bucket can be positioned directly under the object such that when he walks away, the bucket will catch it. Note also that there is a large white block in this area with a pattern that is identical to the one that scrolls across the screen in Ronith's room. Paul returns to the house with the object and pushes it towards the bundle of objects in the lower left hand corner of the room. The object rises up out of the bucket and joins the items on the table. The screen darkens and Paul collects some additional pieces. The screen cuts back to Paul in the gift plane. He explains that he's created a new file. Paul has figured out that this room in Evencare, the room containing Wavy and Randis, is analogous to the area in the new maker plane with the house, since both areas contain a bucket and are shaped in a similar way. Paul calls them counterparts. This gels with the correlation between the pattern on the block in the bathroom and the pattern scrolling across the screen here in this room. Paul's recent experience with the bucket in the house has given him an idea. He pushes the bucket into Ronith's room. He places the bucket under Ronith and subsequently catches it. He reads his new pet's description. Ronith is Toneth's baby half-brother. Because he's younger, he gets to learn from all of Toneth's mistakes. That's why he always looks both ways. He doesn't get into trouble. You won't have to watch him all the time. He's good. Footnote. Recall that in Toneth's description, it states that he, quote, has a broken leg for some reason. Based on the information in Ronith's description, we can infer that Toneth, or whoever Toneth represents in the real world, was in fact hit by a vehicle. Ronith, the younger sibling, has learned to look both ways before crossing the street due to this very incident. He's learned from the experiences of his older brother. Interestingly enough, Ronith looks both ways in the game animation itself. Note again that there's no longer an option to quit the game. The start menu indicates that this is indeed a demo recording. The screen cuts and Paul catches Amber. A prompt comes up. It reads as follows. Congratulations, you caught every pet in Evencare, aside from Toneth, who isn't here yet. You have seen everything in the game so far, but there will obviously be more. It's a growing organism. Your controller inputs will be useful, but your feedback will be even more useful. As Paul reads this section, we hear a series of knocking sounds and some rustling. Footnote. Some people seem to think that Paul is using Morse code to signal that he is in danger. Let's take a closer look. So SOS in Morse code should sound something like this. Three quick tones, three long tones, and then three quick tones again. Let's take a listen to Paul's supposed knocking. I'd say this is not definitive, but it is plausible. There are a series of knocking sounds, and it could be an SOS signal executed somewhat imperfectly, which would make sense if Paul is in a perturbed state. A prompt reads, leave the PlayStation on when you leave. You can stand up now. There's another distinct clicking sound and then an abrupt bang. The screen cuts to black, and that's the end of video 13. At this point, we have a combined total of nearly two and a half hours of gameplay footage. Wow. So there are quite a few things we can deduce from the information presented in these new videos. Let's start with a certain revelation. In video 12, the designer, presumably Rayner, states that he didn't put Bell's features in the child library system because she's not family. So we know that according to Rayner, the general features represented in the system are that of his own family members. And we also know from Care A's description that Rayner is Michael Hammond's older brother. So too can we infer that Care is related in some way to these two individuals since her features are represented in the system. 
Back in video seven, Paul noted that he put Michael's eyebrows on Kara's face. And as you might recall, the result of this combination was the room that contained the censored item. In video 11, Paul notes that he previously found his room in the game. As you know, I believe the room with the censored item is meant to be Paul's room. Now, if this is in fact Paul's room, it stands to reason that his features, a combination of Kara's face and Michael's eyebrows, are represented in the so-called child library system. Ergo, Paul is related to Rainer, Michael, and Care. This would seem to gel with my impression that Paul is a member of this extended family. The exact nature of this relation is unclear, but it would seem that this is a family affair. I previously speculated that this item had been censored to keep Paul's identity private. In order for that to be the case, the censored item must be something that is oddly specific to Paul, something that could theoretically identify him, or at least narrow down his identity. I believe that the proprietors are keeping Paul's identity a secret on the basis that he continues playing the game and making videos. They're holding it over his head, and it's possible they're making other demands as well. Now, why wouldn't Paul want his identity revealed? Well, it could be any number of reasons. It is potentially the case that Paul himself can be implicated in whatever crimes the proprietors are currently involved in. Not that he's necessarily guilty of any crime. The proprietors might just be in a situation where they can essentially frame him. Were the proprietors to leak his information, particularly his identity and a few other key details, there would be legal ramifications for Paul. If that's the case, it makes sense that he would comply with the proprietor's demands. This is contingent on Paul not knowing the identity of the proprietors, or at least not being able to connect them to the situation. Otherwise, you know, he could just turn them in as well. Towards the end of video 13, a prompt tells us that Petscop, the game, is, quote, a growing organism. What does this mean exactly? Allow me to present a few possible explanations. Now, a lot of people are interpreting this phrase growing organism in a foreboding, perhaps even supernatural way, and I totally understand the urge to do so. You know, it could be that a haunted game is systematically consuming people, possessing them, causing them to commit heinous acts, eventually trapping their essence in the game itself. It could very well be that the story is taking that turn, but at this point, I'm an agnostic on the issue. Let's consider an alternative explanation. It could be that Petscop is designed in a recursive manner such that the actions of players are integrated into the game itself. We have no way of knowing how much information the game really takes in, but if we're to believe the message in video 13, it is recording the controller inputs. It could be that the players whose names have been previously entered become characters later on, when some other player starts a new game. This is by no means a supernatural explanation. It requires no magic, no science fiction, no malevolent force at the heart of the game. All it requires is some savvy programming. There would of course be limits to this, namely the game's memory. But here's a thought. Perhaps the game extends beyond the limits of the physical PS1. Perhaps the logic of the game extends into the real world inhabited by Paul. Or rather, the game is being carried out in literal terms, by the proprietors in the real world. Previously, I've identified two major themes in Petscop that reoccur throughout the videos, childhood and puzzles. Well, now a third major theme is emerging, synchronicity. This synchronicity theme plays out in a number of ways. Many people have pointed out the various and really quite striking sorts of congruities that occur between select portions of the gameplay in the videos. This synchronous aspect of the work might be best understood, I think, as a repetition of certain toxic patterns. Patterns which are unwittingly replicated by Paul due to a larger underlying system of perverse incentives at play. Recall that different portions of the game are correlated with one another through the use of various symbols. For example, Quitter's Room is associated with a room in Even Care containing the pet known as Amber. So too are these portions analogous in other, more subtle ways. For instance, in order to access the left side of Quitter's Room, it was required of Paul to do something similar to what he did when he caught Amber. I talk about this in my third investigation video, but I think it bears repeating because this is some next level puzzle crafting right here. 
Paul caught Amber by locking himself into her enclosure, the prison cell on the left-hand side of the room. This prompted Amber to jump back over to her side of the cell, allowing Paul to catch her. Paul then exited the cell through an unseen passageway. In video 10, Paul finds himself stuck in even care after finagling a bit with one of the levers in Amber's room. Presumably, it's this same lever that opens the door leading to the left side of Quitter's room. So he's gotten access to that side of the room, but there's a problem. The mechanism also happens to lock Paul in even care. So it is required of Paul to crash the game in order to return to the lower level. He's able to save his progress his actions in even care using the panic save function. Paul circumvents the closed door in even care by intentionally crashing the game. The process by which this occurs is formally similar to what Paul needed to do in order to catch Amber in the first place. So there's a clear synchronicity even in the way puzzles work in this game, but it's important to note that the parameters of these puzzles change as Paul continues further into the recesses of Petscop. In the example just cited, Paul needed to crash the game. It was required of him to step outside the bounds of the traditional game playing experience in order to progress. One might say that this game is gradually conditioning Paul to think in this way, to make associations not only within the game's parameters, but also with items in the outside world. The game is conditioning Paul to make associations beyond the scope of the PlayStation game. Now, recall this idea that the proprietors are carrying out the logic of the game in the real world. If this is, in fact, the case, it would seem that the game is conditioning Paul to do the same. What's going on with the demo sequences, exactly? I'm not entirely sure, but I have a few ideas. I had previously assumed that the demo sequences were perhaps sessions from previous players, but it would appear that Paul is actually playing during the demo sequence in video 13. So that's strange. What's happened here? Well, let's note that in video 13, a prompt says that the player's controller inputs are going to be useful, but that their feedback is going to be even more useful. This would seem to be a message for someone testing the game, but let's consider another possibility. The term feedback in this context might imply that the player's actions are contributing to a self-perpetuating feedback loop. Now, we're going to get into some metaphysical territory here, so bear with me. Petscop works through a gradual process of conditioning. But what is the end goal? It's still not entirely clear, but I'm beginning to suspect that the process leads the player to dissociate from reality. Over the course of time, the logic and sensory data from the game become totally indistinguishable from the outside world. The work is specifically calling attention to this distinction. At various points during the 12th video, the game asks Belle about her situation. Tellingly, the game asks, are you sitting on a chair? Can you look around the room? Is there still a room? If this theory holds true, it would seem that the game has been systematically integrating the actions of various people, such that when they play the game beyond a certain point, they cannot return to the real world. Not in a physical sense, but in an emotional and intellectual sense. The distinction between the real world and the game world becomes so hopelessly blurred that even when the player isn't, you know, playing Petscop, they still feel as though they're in the game. It's an all-encompassing form of brainwashing, I guess you would say. Paul's demo session during the 13th video might just represent his complete dissociation from reality. We've already seen signs that Paul could have entered a dissociative state. Recall the bathroom situation in video 11. Let's also keep in mind the fact that there is no quit option during the demo session. Implicitly, the game is suggesting that quitting the game is no longer an option. Even if the game is turned off, Paul is still playing. So whatever happens at the end of video 13, whatever those various noises are, even if Paul has gotten up out of his chair and left the room or whatever, I believe it is the case that Paul is still playing Petscop, in his own mind at least. Now keep in mind that the game has conditioned Paul to do some pretty questionable things. He's kept the game on despite warning signs that it's still causing harm to someone, and in video 11, Paul repeated Marvin's actions, essentially kidnapping the character known as Care A. The game has desensitized Paul to certain morally dubious actions, and now, 
It's blurring the line between the game and reality itself. That is a troublesome combination, if you ask me. Back in video six, Paul speculates that the game is trying to make it seem like it's inhabited by an entity, but he expresses skepticism at the idea. He says that in order for this to be true, a real-time back and forth would be required. Well, I think you might know where I'm going with this. Is this the real-time back and forth Paul was looking for? It's difficult to say. Marvin's responses are rudimentary, and it's entirely possible that they're pre-programmed. Given the information we currently have available, there's no definitive evidence that the game is hosting an entity, as Paul calls it. But let's try and think about this on a metaphoric level. Marvin employs a mode of communication by which certain buttons on the PlayStation are relayed into syllables. In response, the player learns the language of his or her abuser, and they begin to use it as well. As such, the player becomes further entrenched in the logic of the game. And, well, it would be an understatement at this point to say that the logic presented is really kind of twisted. I think that's been pretty thoroughly established. In a metaphorical sense, we can speculate that this is meant to represent the tragic and cyclical nature of abuse. It's an issue of patterns repeating themselves across generations. But let's think critically about this, because it is not inevitable that the abused becomes the abuser. It is possible to break that pattern. People have done that. We don't have to accept the premises upon which this framework is built. There are other ways to conceive of things like trauma, neglect, abuse, etc., to categorize people in the manner depicted in Petscop, to think of a person in terms of these various forms, A, B, and NLM, this essentially works to dehumanize them. It reduces them to their trauma, and it dehumanizes the designer in the process. I think whatever the case with respect to Rayner's true intentions with this game, he has nonetheless accepted the terms of Marvin's twisted logic. This is evident based on the framework of the game itself. One of the themes of the work is the problem of uncovering and perhaps even coming to terms with the truth in the aftermath of traumatic events. It serves as a meditation on the sorts of challenges one might face, the obstacles that prevent one from moving forward after these sorts of events. Also, I think the work is a critical reflection on how society perceives those who have experienced trauma. If we operate under the assumption that Rayner is the creator of the game, it logically follows that the way things are categorized in the game are indications of Rayner's mental state. His attitudes are implicit within the game's design, and thus, his framework forms a lasting impression on players. It creates a self-fulfilling prophecy of sorts. Rayner is continually depicted with an underlying sort of pessimism, a sense that things are hopelessly unfixable. In the description for Toneth, Rayner says, when that dog wags its tail and appears happy, it's not real. So he can't even bring himself to believe that a dog is capable of momentary joy. Why is Rayner like this? Well, there are a number of textual clues that could provide some insight. Primarily, I think there are a number of indications that Rayner hasn't had a great life. In Care A's description, Rayner insinuates that he is Michael A's brother. We can infer that Rayner is talking about Michael Hammond, the name on the grave in video two. We can also possibly infer that Rayner's description of Ronith is a thinly veiled reference to Michael, based on the sibling dynamic that's laid out here. As such, it follows that Rayner's description of a wounded dog is a thinly veiled reference to himself that's telling in the larger context of the narrative. Keep in mind that assuming Rayner is in fact the designer of Petscop, the framing of events is all through his perceptual lens, if that makes sense. For example, this framework by which Rayner categorizes victims in A, B, and NLM forms, this is a construct of Rayner's making. This is the case whatever his intentions may be. It could be that Rayner has created the game in an effort to expose a crime or a series of crimes, but even if Rayner intended for this game to serve as an expose of sorts, it is nonetheless the case that the proprietors have co-opted the game for their own malicious purposes. That's my working theory anyway. 
They're able to do so because Rayner seems to have internalized the language of these would-be criminals. As such, he is perpetuating a harmful framework that serves to benefit the proprietors. Now, categories are not intrinsically harmful. Quite often, they're useful and beneficial to society at large. Obviously, it is helpful from a medical standpoint, for instance, that certain medications can treat people with high blood pressure. But oftentimes, historically speaking, putting people into categories has been harmful to those outside the bounds of what we consider normal. The way we tend to describe and moralize certain differences has been harmful. Where we draw the line matters, and how we use language matters. And perhaps we should think twice about the way we use language. After all, language itself is an interpretation. These things are subject to debate, and that effort should not be conflated with an attempt to debate the merits of objective claims. Doing so only begs the question. The same is true when it comes to the designing of systems, such as that of, say, for instance, video games. Thomas T. Hills, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Warwick in Coventry in the United Kingdom, argues that algorithms are increasingly being made in our own image. As such, they have the potential to fall victim to superstition, paranoia, and bias, just like humans can. With this in mind, I want to take a brief foray into a topic that might seem a little out of left field. There's one stark allusion to the concept of transhumanism in Petscop that I think is worth talking about. Transhumanism is the general belief that we as humans can evolve beyond our current biological limitations through the use of advanced technology. How does Petscop allude to this? Well, way back in video 8, a particular combination of blue and red cars come rushing out of the tunnel. It was discovered that this could be meant to represent binary code. If you Google this particular combination, the following article comes up from the International Journal of Machine Consciousness. Digital Immortality, Self or 00101110. Here's the abstract. In this paper, we explore from several angles the possibility and practicality of one of the major tenets of the transhumanist movement, the intention to upload human minds to computers. The first part of the paper assumes that mind uploading is possible and will become quite commonplace in the near 21st century future, a la Ray Kurzweil and cohorts. This assumption allows us to explore several of its problematic implications for personal identity, especially the effects it will have on questions of duty, responsibility, interpersonal relationships, and culpability in the case of a crime. In the second part of the paper, we take a deeper and more critical look at whether mind uploading is indeed metaphysically possible and offer some neurobiologically inspired arguments against its feasibility. Now, there are all sorts of people who are interested in transhumanist ideas, and I don't want to paint with too broad a brush here. I actually agree with the main premise that humans can use technology to evolve beyond our current biological limitations. I mean, I think that's self-evident. And if we extrapolate current trends, I think it's clear that we're headed in that direction. This is, of course, provided we don't blow ourselves up or create malicious superhuman AI that kills everyone first. But the question for me is an issue of implementation. For full disclosure, my main issue with the transhumanist movement, if it can be accurately called a movement at this point, is that the discourse largely ignores the existence of class and other ethical quandaries that will come about as a result of clear inequities within our current society. At best, these folks tend to say technology will make everyone's lives better regardless of inequities. And to that, I say, show me the evidence because historically it hasn't always played out that way. I think there's an obvious strain of utopianist thought that exists here. Technology is always a reflection on the society in which it's created. The inequities that exist within our current society will necessarily be reflected by hypothetical tech associated with transhumanism. I think that point is hammered home with lucidity in Petscop itself. The flip side to the utopian view espoused by many transhumanists is the dystopian framework presented in Petscop. 
Rather than solve the underlying problems of society, this game amplifies them and perhaps even serves to perpetuate them. The diabolical machinations of those carrying out the horrible deeds are reflected in the framework of the game itself. We can think of Petscop as a useful commentary on the pitfalls of transhumanism in this way. I've been thinking a lot about how we might situate Petscop in relation to other works in this emergent digital culture. My basic working thesis is as follows. I think Petscop can be thought of as an artful sort of examination on how certain material conditions can give rise to the exploitation, abuse, and mistreatment of children. This is primarily facilitated through a process of commodification. For instance, the game seems to purposefully conflate individuals with pets. This aim, the manner in which Petscop can be thought of as an examination of such a process, this is in part what differentiates it from your typical piece of, say, for instance, crime fiction. Its scope is far more, well, I want to say ambitious, but I think the more accurate framing would be precise because how Petscop accomplishes this task has everything to do with what it is, how it's structured, and everything that entails. In the words of media critic Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message. If you recall way back in my very first Petscop investigation video, I had a somewhat idiosyncratic interpretation of the name Petscop, specifically the latter portion, Scop. According to a history of oral interpretation, the word scop is an Old English term used to refer to a certain kind of poet. A scop was typically attached to a specific court, in the same way we might think of a court jester serving at the pleasure of a particular king. It seems to me that the medium is rather important in this context. A scop is thought to have relayed their poetry through the oral tradition. But, importantly, there's some contention about the historical accuracy of this term and the way it's used. Professor Seth Lehrer suggests that perhaps the distinctly oral quality of Old English poetry was itself a kind of fiction. Perhaps the Anglo-Saxon oral poet, this so-called scop that is the point of our discussion, never really existed in the first place. The term could have just been a literary device, one that allowed poetry of the time to give the impression of orality and performance. Think of Petscop's format in the same way. The Let's Play format is just a conduit through which the story is being told. The medium is one that many from our generation are familiar with. It's a modern narrative device used to give the impression of immediacy and given the tone of Petscop, it's even endowed with a sense of poignancy. Okay, so I know that seems like an incredibly obtuse thing to say about the name of this work, but let's consider the nature of the work we're talking about here. Nothing is straightforward with Petscop. It's a web series about a fictional game with cryptic illusions and real world references. The protagonist occupies a fictional universe that we know literally nothing about, but we can assume to be somewhat like our own. Not to get too terribly abstract, but I would say that there is a distinct kind of formalization going on here. That is to say, the form of the work is itself a thematic conceit of the work. The format works to expose how a systematic framework, the game itself, perpetuates human suffering across generations. Or perhaps it would be better to say, over time. So too does this format work to heighten the immediacy of the viewing experience, thereby giving the work a staggered sort of serialesque quality to it. Videos are delivered in loose batches over the span of months, information is slowly doled out in the process, but larger questions are often raised with each new video. I said in my fourth video that it is not the various puzzles of Petscop that should be our primary focus, but rather the puzzle of the puzzles. I stated at the beginning of this excursion that it would be appropriate to consider Petscop a piece of digital folklore. I think that as the series progresses, that becomes increasingly clear. Academic and notable fairy tale expert Jack Zeip said, Over the centuries, we have transformed the ancient myths and folk tales and made them into the fabric of our lives. Consciously and unconsciously, we weave the narratives of myth and folk tale into our daily existence. Zipes has written a lot about fairy tales and the social function they tend to serve. Zipes argued that the world's projected by the best of our fairy tales, reveal the gaps between the truth and falsehood in our immediate society. 
I think that applies quite aptly in relation to Petscop. How has the folktale changed in the age of the internet? I mean, there are people who have devoted their whole careers to exploring that topic. The interesting thing about this very particular kind of work, Petscop, is that it fosters a critical perspective by virtue of its enigmatic nature. This, I think, is a distinct feature of an emerging form of digital folklore, of which Petscop is a part. There's a component to the work that is distinctly hypertextual. It contains references to real-world events such as the Newmaker incident or to point towards another example, the digital immortality paper. In some ways, the work seems to create the impression of a sort of oral tradition we might recognize in myths and fairy tales from earlier times. This makes sense considering that the creepypasta genre emerged out of a similar aesthetic, but this hypertextual component is important as well. Essentially, these references serve as allusions, things that indicate or point toward some deeper themes of the work. But not only does Petscop work to foster a critical perspective, it also has served to build the foundation for an entire community, one primarily focused on analyzing the work, an interpretive community. By virtue of its particular form, the work is encouraging participation. That, I think, is a good sign as far as the potential of art in the digital age is concerned. That wraps it up for this installment of Nightmare Masterclass. Again, if you enjoy my videos and have a few bucks to spare, please consider supporting me on ko-fi.com forward slash Nightmare Masterclass. Any donation, large or small, is highly appreciated. Special thanks to Will, Nonplayer, Well Said, Xenolalia, Mr. Idealist, Relvitica, and One Tired Med Student for their recent donations. Thank you for watching, and good night.